Good morning. I want to welcome you to the, the first 10 Executive Speaker Series for this fall. Uh, it's, we're excited again to be able to offer this to the greater Fort Worth community and the Fort Worth Dallas community, as we like to say, at, at TCU. Um, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors uh, again this year. We couldn't do this without the generous support of so many good friends, and that includes our platinum sponsor for many years, Frost Bank. Uh, thank you very much for that. Our gold sponsor is the Fort Worth Business Press. And then our silver sponsors are the Balcom Agency, Cockrell Printing, and our bronze sponsors are Lindbeck, Texas Health, and Acme Brick. Again, thank you to all of our sponsors. <laughs> We're very excited today to, to have Jeff Morris with us. Jeff is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Allon uh, USA. He joined the company when it was formed in August 2000 uh, after Allon Israel uh, company purchased the downstream operations of Adolfina Petrochemicals. Uh, he oversees Allon's USA businesses, which we'll be talking about this morning. Uh, he has more than 30 years of experience, uh, began his career with FINA uh, in 1974 and has held different technical positions in chemicals and R&D. He's a graduate of Texas Tech University, but he knew he should wear a purple shirt today. Um, <laughs> He earned a bachelor's degree at Texas Tech in chemical engineering in 1974. He's an active alumnus, and he was recognized as a Texas Tech Distinguished Engineer and presented with a Distinguished Alumni Award in 2008. He serves as a member of the Academy of Chemical Engineers and holds 10 U.S. and six foreign patents in the field of polymer processing and production. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jeff Morris. They put us right in the front of the stage here, so we're going to be hopefully, careful. Hopefully, we won't fall off. Exactly. So do that. So. Well, I good did morning. Wear my, my purple tie today. We like my that. Red tie. It's good taste. Well, well I, I have to that. take up the way the Raiders are playing this year. I need to help. <laughs> exactly. them. Could join the Frogs. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about Elon. I know you're you're in asphalt and refining. You do a lot of different things. Tell us about the company and what kind of operations you have. Okay. Well, we are um, a. a oil company, a refining company. We're in the downstream sector for those who are familiar with the energy sector. So what that means to uh, you is we um, buy crude oil. We do not produce any type of crude oil. So we buy crude oil and we take it from there. We have three refineries, one in uh, West Texas, one in California, one in Louisiana. And we convert that to make products for you, gasoline and diesel. Uh, in West Texas, we're integrated through to uh, a retail segment. Uh, all the way through to the 7-Eleven stores. We're the largest licensee of the 7-Eleven brand in the United States. So uh, if the frogs ever do play the Raiders and you're out in Lubbock sometime, you stop in the 7-Eleven store, that's our store. And it's a good integrated business for us because we supply the gasoline to that store from our refinery in Big Spring. So that's the background of that business. We're also one of the largest asphalt uh, producers in the United States. We are the largest asphalt producer in California, uh, second largest west of the Mississippi, largest in Arizona in the entire western segment. And that's integrated with our refinery in California. We run very heavy California crudes. And so as an outlet, we uh, produce asphalt. We also, just as a matter of sight, we are the largest producer of asphalt in the country that uses old tires, ground tire rubber asphalt. In fact, the largest ground tar rubber asphalt producing plant in the United States is here in Texas at Big Spring, Texas. So again, it's, we like that business, we're large in it, but it's a part of our integrated strategy with the refinery in California. Well, we think about the rising price of carbon. So how are you dealing with that as you think about the gas prices and all? What does it mean for your refining process? Well, this makes a big difference for not only us, but refineries in general. I don't know, you may have noticed or may not have that over the last couple of years, there's been about 10 refineries that have been closed in the United States. Uh, we have uh, more refineries than which we need because there's more supply than demand. Put it in perspective, in the late uh, 1970s, about 1974, there were 400 refineries in the United States uh, today there's 148. The 148 refineries that we have today are producing about the same amount of fuel that was produced in 1974. So over a 30-year period, the demand for fuel 
in the United States has been nominally flat. Uh, and the efficiency of our plants continue to improve. So we um, predicted, as a company, projected as early as 2005 that the demand for gasoline would peak in the United States and begin to decline. And that, in fact, has occurred. That, uh, Exxon and others are now have joined and said that they believe, and I agree with them, that the peak gasoline consumption in the U.S. occurred in 2007. And since that time, going forward, and uh, as far as the eye can see, gasoline demand in the United States will decline. Now, why is it declining? There's actually three reasons, one being the price of carbon. But the most important is the fuel efficiency standard, the CAFE standards. In the energy bill in 2007 that was passed by Congress, the fuel efficiency of vehicles was required to improve to 36 miles per gallon between now and 2020. Now that was accelerated by the Obama administration and moved that up to 2016. So between now and 2016, new vehicles have to improve their fuel efficiency from what they are today to 36 miles per gallon. That's approximately a 25% improvement in fuel efficiency. Now, we are 100% convinced that that will happen because it's the law of the land and that the previous CAFE standards have been implemented. So if you see the uh, your customer improving their efficiency of your product by 25%, there's no way in the world that you, our customers, are going to drive 25% mi more miles between now and 2020. So it became clear that, that gasoline demand was going down. The other thing that's occurring is the fleet change, and we uh, saw that uh, peak, if you will, uh, point, the uh, transition point in 2008. Now, I've been in the business a long, long time in the refining business, and almost every month, uh, every quarter, a, a, a reporter will call and say, you know, why is the price of gasoline so high? It's just one thing I've learned over 37 years in the business is the price of gasoline is always too high. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's a dollar a gallon, a dollar fifty a gallon, two dollar a gallon, two fifty a gallon. If I go ask you, what do you think about the price of gas, what are you going to tell me? It's too high. That's just the way it is with our customers. We understand that. But I had a view over the years that as gasoline expense went up to $2 a gallon, that the behavior of our customers would change. It did not. I thought when the gas went to two fifty dollars a gallon, the behavior of our customers would change. It did not. We finally reached that inflection point where the behavior of our customers changed when we went to $4 a gallon. 2008, we hit $4 a gallon. People said, enough's enough. So what has happened? What's happening is, uh, I'll tell you this story. You as a customer in our industry producing energy fuel, and this flows right back into those in this room that may be in the oil sector. If you drill for oil, if you're natural gas, that goes into utilities. But if you're involved in the transportation sector, um, this is uh, critically important. Uh, on an annual basis, you as a customer generally need, have very, very, very little effect on your demand for fuel. You are not, you're going to drive to work, you're going to drive to school, you're going to go see your, your relatives, you may cut out a vacation here and there, but you will change your demand maybe plus or minus one or two percent. That's a really all you can affect. That's not a big deal for us. Where you make a, a important decision for our industry is when you buy a vehicle. If you sell a vehicle, trade one in that's 15 miles per gallon, and you buy one that's 25 miles per gallon, now you've done something. You've changed your demand by 25%, just like that. Drive the same miles, go see grandma, change your demand. So the other effect is the fleet change. The fleet did not begin to change until after we saw $4 gas. And the behavior change that we've seen, not only by you as customers, but by the auto industry, is now in the types of, of vehicles that uh, are being sold. The number one, if you're in this transportation sector, in the oil business, the number one leading indicator in our business that I watch is the showroom floors. Just walk down to the local Frank Kent dealership or another dealership and see what's on the showroom floor. So that's what, that's what the demand will be in the future. And what you see on the showroom floors today 
is very different than what you saw on the showroom floors in 2007. So that's another indication of the ga uh, gasoline demand declining. The third element is carbon. It is zero probability that uh, carbon will have a higher price in the United States uh, short term. Uh, we've gone through the cap and trade or cap and tax or carbon tax, whatever you want to call it. Uh, discussion and decided we're not going to do that. But uh, it's hard for me to predict whether carbon will be more expensive 10 years from now or 20 years from now or 30 years from now. Uh, I'll leave that to you to decide. I think there is some probability that there will be a price on carbon. Uh, we have prepared our business for that. If there's a price on carbon, that will also have an effect on demand. We know that the amount of carbon in gasoline is higher than the amount of carbon in diesel. It's, it's the highest, most concentrated carbon fuel. So if there's a price on carbon, gasoline is going to be disadvantaged again. So for those three reasons, we decided as a company to move away from gasoline, and we predicted, we developed a strategy as a company going towards uh, the heavy-duty fleet and diesel vehicles. Uh, why have we done that? Uh, again, to the light-duty fleet, the vehicles that all of you drove and I drove this morning to, to come here, um, today we have alternatives. If you want to go buy a hybrid, there's a whole range of hybrids. A few years ago, there was just one, but now you, there's 20, 25, 30 different models, great vehicles that you can go purchase, so you have that alternative today. Uh, if you want to go buy a clean diesel vehicle, which actually, by all this science, is uh, lower emissions, more fuel efficient, lower carbon fuel than gasoline, you can do that. There's, all, there's a wide range of uh, diesel vehicles. In fact, the, Green Car of the Year for uh, Green Car Magazine two years ago was the Jetta TDI, and the last year the uh, Green Car of the Year was the Audi A3 TDI. So you have those uh, options to you today. And in a not too distant future, you'll be able to buy a plug-in hybrid. You'll be able to buy the Chevy Volt or something like that. And so you have those alternatives. Now, if we have this demand decrease and you're in the business of making fuels, what do you do? Well, let's look at the heavy-duty fleet. On the heavy-duty fleet, we do not have today, have developed many alternatives. Uh, Southwest Airlines is doing a great job advertising that your bags can fly free. But if Southwest Airlines was flying electric-driven airplanes, they would have a big marketing problem, in my view. I'd, I'm not going to fly on that, that battery-driven airplane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just or a hybrid airplane. You know, it's just not <laughs> my thing to do. Plug it in. Plug it in. Get that on board, <laughs> and let's go to <laughs> take off. So it's the thing. The, the jets. There's not a real alternative to today. A real feasible alternative to jet fuel. Ships. We're not going to have a battery-driven uh, container ship pick up containers in. China and take them across the Pacific, deliver them to Long Beach. It doesn't make practical sense today. The, the rail system uh, here in Fort Worth, rail is critically important. In Europe, the, the rail system is electrified throughout Europe, uh, so it can be done. There's technology to do it, but I, I, it just doesn't seem feasible for us to electrify the rail from Los Angeles to Fort Worth. I don't see that in our future. Hybrid 18-wheelers, currently technology is absolutely there to do that today. In fact, Benny Keith runs uh, hybrid 18-wheelers in Dallas to distribute uh, their Budweiser around Dallas. That makes great sense if you're distributing fuel or distributing products in a city like Dallas, but if you're picking up a container in Long Beach and taking it to Chicago, then hybrid doesn't do you any good. So what does that mean? The demand growth curve going forward for uh, movement of goods is positive. The demand growth curve going forward for the movement of people is negative. So we focused on the diesel side of the equation. Specifically, how have we done that as a business? The average production of diesel from a refinery in the United States is 30 percent today. The refinery, last refinery which we purchased, which was one in Louisiana, produces today 50 percent diesel fuel. The, our refining system in California we are de redesigning it to only produce less than 20% gasoline. It will produce over 50% diesel fuel. 
So we're more interested in fueling the, the trucks and trains that are bringing the goods to Fort Worth than we are uh, moving the people around California. People move around California, but they may be doing electric vehicles or something of that sort. So we've uh, taken, all that means also as an industry that we will need fewer refineries in the industry. We won't need as many as we have today. There's a uh, belief that we, today we uh, have about 15, 16 million barrel a day of refining capacity in the United States. Within a decade, 20 years, we'll probably need a million barrel per day less than what we have today. So this whole concept, people get confused in the energy sector many times, say we need to build more refineries, we need to build them on military bases, we need to do this kind of stuff, that kind of stuff. And we never have, we won't. But for us in the industry, we just have to be uh, more efficient. It doesn't mean that people aren't going to use goods. One thing I'm completely convinced of is people are going to still move. They're not going to sit at home. And they're going to need transportation fuel. It's just for us to make the right transportation fuel. So you've given me a good reason to be able to tell our 19-year-old daughter that her 2001 gas customer will help your company um, <laughs> uh, with that. <laughs> when you think about uh, your clean fleet program, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty interesting because you're you want to sell a lot of gas, but you're, you you have hybrids and diesels there. Why did you decide to do that? It's a big part of what you're trying. Well, I, I think it's um, dealing with reality, and I I do have a view uh, that we in this industry, in the energy sector, um, uh, see the world through oil-colored glasses, and we have a bias and we, we continue to view the world in our way, not in the way that our customers view uh, the world. Uh, the hybrids and diesels have been very successful. Um, people are concerned about emissions today. People are concerned about uh, fuel efficiency today. Uh, if you can, we know this by science. We can reduce the emissions of the United States from the transportation sector by 30% today with the technology we have now and not affect our quality of life one, one iota. Why isn't that a good thing to do? And personally, I believe that if it's a good thing to do, inevitably it will occur. There was a study done by UC Irvine a few years ago, which I read, which compared the, um, for the light duty fleet, the three different vehicle systems which we had, which were a hybrid, diesel, and gasoline. And it compared the uh, total cost of the vehicle over the life of the vehicle. It included in this uh, analysis the initial purchase price of the vehicle, the uh, cost of the fuel of the vehicle over the life of the vehicle, the terminal value of the vehicle whenever it was uh, sold, the, how long the, the asset would run. And in addition, uh, added a $20 per ton charge for emissions. Said if you for all the emissions that you have, we're gonna charge you $20 a ton. Why'd they come up with $20 a ton? That was a nominal price of carbon in Europe today. So if in the future carbon has a price, maybe that's a nominal price. And this was a California uh, university, so they had their own uh, biases. They were surprised by the outcome. The lowest cost transportation system was diesel. Didn't surprise me at all. Second lowest cost transportation system was hybrid. The most expensive transportation system is uh, gasoline. Now, putting aside the cost of um, emissions, even in that case, it showed that a diesel vehicle or a hybrid vehicle over the life of the vehicle is equally cost effective as gasoline. Now, the initial price of those vehicles is higher. So I can understand why an individual may not want to pay a higher initial cost and expect to get the money back over a period of time. But if you're running a fleet and you're going to keep the vehicle through the life of the vehicle, which we do as fleets, what difference does it make? So we decided, because of our view, uh, we announced last year that in our company, effective uh, last October, every replacement vehicle, whether it be a pickup truck in a refinery or a a, a car for our marketing rep, every replacement vehicle will either be a clean diesel or be uh, a hybrid. It fits our business model because we're focused on diesel anyway, so I'm happy mm -hmm. with that. So we're, uh, that, but it also is uh, unique, but I think it's appropriate. I mean, I challenge you and um, 
here in Fort Worth. I've challenged my colleagues in Dallas. Uh, we're not meeting the uh, EPA air quality standards. We are uh, uh, ozone emissions last year in the Dallas-Fort Worth area were 86 parts per billion. Uh, the standard was 85 parts per billion, going down to 60 parts per billion. Uh, what is wrong with us as companies adopting, changing our fleets in this way? It doesn't cost us anything. Uh, the vehicles are there. Uh, and it helps clean the air a little bit. So I think if, if we as fleets did more and more of that, and many of you have fleets here in this, this room, uh, we, uh, that it would be the right thing to do. And, and I, not only we're not, uh, we're doing it because, in my view, it's the, the trend line for the industry. And I can fight against the trend line and get beat up, uh, or I can, uh, adopt the trend line and maybe be successful. Okay. Yep. I know we're going to come back to the industry in a few minutes with the questions. Um, let's turn a little bit to management. Um, mm -hmm. we'll talk about it a little bit. So how did you get uh, from being a, an engineer to into the senior management role? What was that like for you personally? Well, it was, um, a, you know, it wasn't a, a specific I'm going to move from here to there and step changes along the way of the career. It was a, a continuum. It was a um, uh, the way you progress with a company. I've been fortunate to work for the same company for the entirety of my career. That doesn't happen much these days. So I've worked for this company since I've joined the Big Spring Refinery 37 years ago and we still own it today. And over the years I've had a group of owners, different sets of owners, but I've worked in the same industry. So it, it's and it's the continuum that I think that you have in many uh, industries. You um, start off as a professional. You can be a professional as an engineer, you can be a professional as a, a marketer, you can be a professional as a, a banker, you can be a professional as an analyst, whatever your profession is. And if you do well in your profession, I was fortunate, I had 16 patents, things of that sort. So the, the, the foundation for success in uh, business success to get to be a CEO, in my view, is your foundation as a professional. It's very, very rare that you find very successful business people at the top that aren't, in the base case, very successful in their prof profession, whatever it is, whether it's be banking or finance or engineering or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was a successful professional. And then naturally what happens is, um, the bosses say, okay, you're a very good professional. We think that we'll give you an opportunity or you should be a, a great manager. Well, that, you're not trained for that. That's not your profession to be a manager. And so, uh, unfortunately, um, more fail than succeed in that transition. That we all know of very, very good professionals that when they have that, up, they move to that management role, they're not prepared for it. Or not, skilled for it, and, and even those who are um, skilled struggle. Uh, so I made that transition. I think the <clears throat> big difference for me, and the one thing I would recommend to, especially the, the students in this room, is uh, you need to invest in your education throughout your career. So you're being, you're invested, taught a particular skill set today, whether it be finance, engineering, or whatever, so you're, prepared to do that and you go execute it. But when you have that opportunity to move on to the, the next level, you need to invest in learning to be a manager. One of the things that helped me a lot was I went and invested. I went to Columbia and went to some other schools and invested in myself uh, to develop skills that I didn't have otherwise. And I think that's one of the reasons that allowed me to be successful in the, the area of management. So you learned that skill set was successful. And then ultimately somebody said, okay, you're doing that well. well uh, move you up into uh, areas of finance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you then have to invest in yourself again. You have to learn that skill set again. Uh, many managers fail as executives. More managers fail than succeed as executives. That transition is also a winnowing time, and, and uh, I think those who uh, progress through that are those who, again, uh, are, are learn uh, changed the way in which they work, uh, work in a different way than they have in the past. So it's 
it wasn't anything spectacular and somebody selected me out of a group and all the, mm -hmm. it was, it's a process, it's a career. Mm -hmm. Big Springs to Israel. Big Spring to Israel. From uh, the, the mayor of Big Spring to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. It's, a, it's an amazing difference. So what's it like to work with a, I mean, a truly international company? You probably go to Israel once in a while. I do, I go once or twice a year. <clears throat> I really enjoy it, it's a great country, I love it. So what's it, what is it like having a, when you really are, because you are an international company, uh, what's that been, what are those management challenges? Are they? Um, we've been owned over the years as our company, <clears throat> we were, when I originally joined the company, we were uh, Belgian owned. So I uh, worked with our Belgian colleagues for a number of years and learned to work with them. And then uh, a French company, Total, bought FINA. And so for a period of time we were French owned, so I made the transition to work with the uh, French owners. And, Went to Paris regularly and dealt with that. And then they the decided, the French decided they didn't want the assets any longer, so they put them on the market and then we became Israeli owned. And so now I've been that one. I think the, um, what I would say for the, again, for the people entering their careers here, think about this, is you have to be um, very, very cognizant of the cultural differences. Um, Whatever, if I you hear nothing else I say today, and this is an old, the senior executives in this room know this to be the fact, but it's all about relationships. Everything, what, if you're gonna succeed as a manager, it's about relationships. If you're gonna succeed as an executive, it's about relationships. If you're going to go get your financing for your business, it's about relationships. If you're going to, if you're going to succeed in the international world, it's about relationships. Um, the culture in Belgium is different than it is in Texas. The culture in France is different than it is in Fort Worth. The, cu the culture in Jerusalem is definitely different than it is uh, in Dallas. And uh, the best example I have is our, our chairman, uh, David Wiseman, who's CEO of Elan Israel. Uh, David has, one of the reasons he's a very successful businessman in the U.S., but I've found many uh, if his Israeli colleagues not be successful businessmen in the United States, is his ability to adapt. The ability to adapt is a critical thing. The ability for you to change, to uh, relate to the person across the table that may be different than you. You can't expect them to change to your style. You need to have the ability to change to their style. That's the, the key, because there's no... So I watched David, and there's a very different style of being successful as a businessman in Israel than there is a style of being a successful businessman in the United States. Very, very different. It, I would never be successful as a businessman in Israel utilizing the style and utilizing the things that I learned from Columbia and Harvard, et cetera. That would not work. I would be run over. I would not be a successful businessman there. Uh, alternatively, if uh, David Wiseman was not willing to adapt, he would never be a successful businessman in the United States. So that's a key uh, attribute, is to uh, first uh, respect and to uh, understand the, the culture in which you're working, mm -hmm. where you are, whether it be Israel, France, Belgium, India, mm -hmm. Japan, wherever the, the cultures are uh, very, very different. And, and also we need to be a little less, in my view, a little less arrogant, because most of the world has worked very, very hard to uh, accommodate us. Uh, most, you can go almost anywhere in the world today and do business in English. That that's become the, the language of, of business. So what does that mean? The rest of the world has moved to us. The rest of the world has taken the time in their schools and their elementary schools and middle schools and high schools and universities to learn English so that we can work well with them. Well, that's a pretty significant step. You know, that's important. It's not their culture. And we need to appreciate that, that that's, that's an investment that was made. So the, the world as a whole, for the most part, because we're the predominant economy, has tried to uh, move towards us, we need to at least make a few steps. So we're in, we're in somebody's home, we're in Israel or France or Belgium or wherever, 
need to make it, uh, some efforts to um, understand the culture. We need to make some efforts to understand the way in which uh, work is done there. We need to make some efforts to adjust uh, work in a different way than the, when we're there than when we're here. And if we do, that they'll be recognized, be appreciated, and what we will do, we'll build a relationship and we'll be successful. Yeah. Before we open it to the audience for questions, I know you've established, while, while you've been in uh, your position, you've established a foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about that a little bit. You know, why is that important? What, what is the corporate responsibility to the community? And what are your feelings about that? I feel strongly about philanthropy. I think very, virtually every business and man in this room feels strongly about philanthropy. But I also feel that there's, uh, like in business, there's better ways to do it and not better. We've adopted a um, methodology. Stacy Grau is here from the Neely School who's worked with us on this and Bob Hopkins is here who's work, uh, worked with us on this. I call it uh, strategic philanthropy and it's worked very very well for us as a company. Uh, you named uh, earlier the, the sponsors of this event. It's important for the sponsors of this event to do this because they believe in this event it's also important for the sponsors of events to be recognized because they want to, their brand to be recognized. There's an amount, amount of brand recognition, sure. brand value that comes out. It's important. There's that synergy. Uh, we've been able to increase the value of the Elan brand in Dallas uh, substantially through how we've done strategic philanthropy. But we've also been able to help uh, Dallas, and maybe I need to do more of that in Fort Worth, but I'll use Dallas as an example. Uh, today, uh, the Elan brand is well known in the community of Dallas. Ten years ago, when we started up, we were not known at all. Uh, how have we uh, done that? We've used, in my view, what it used, used classic entrepreneurial business principles in philanthropy. It's not a matter of just having a line item on the budget. Here's your $10,000. Go out. Somebody go figure out how to write checks to the little league, and I'm not going to worry about it. It's as much a a business strategy it is uh, anything else. So what we, uh, you need to be an early adopter of uh, technologies that are transforming and you uh, need to use leverage. What do successful entrepreneurs do? They don't use their own money, they use your money, right? And hopefully they, they'll give it back some days. Sure. They do, some days they don't. But exactly. That's what they do. They go see the VC guys, give me some money. That's what entrepreneurs do. They have an idea, but they, so they use leverage. Uh, they have um, innovative, transforming ideas. Some of them work, some of them don't. But if you take risk in philanthropy, then you, as a, you can be rewarded. So let's give you an example. The first philanthropic uh, exercise we did in Dallas was in uh, communities and schools. There is a communities and schools here in Fort Worth. I'd encourage you to get to know it. It's a, an education. What's higher leverage in education? I'll, I have a, uh, I'll do a test here among you. I've become to believe over the year, and since we're in an academic enterprise, I, I want to commend and recognize all the educators in this room. I've become to believe over the years that there's not a higher leverage profession in the entire world than to have an educator. Uh, I will, you know, how we value that profession, that's a whole other dis discussion. And how do I know this is the highest leverage profession of any profession in the U.S.? I'd ask everyone in this room to think about the five most influential people in your life. Just think, who, who are the five most influential people in your life? And I will guarantee that 99.9% .9 of you, one of those persons on that list will be an educator. And there will be no other profession that meets that criteria. That's my proof. It's a high leverage. Uh, so we, get, we got involved in education. We involved the communities and schools, which for $500 a year, I have a 90% success rate of assuring that a uh, at-risk student graduates from high school. That's a pretty good investment mm -hmm. because we, we know the value of the high school education to society, and we know the cost to us as taxpayers if we don't get. So for 500 bucks a year, it's a high leverage so it's a transforming type of technology, education, which we get, became involved. Other transforming type, we know here in Fort Worth, uh, Bass Hall, Sundance Square, tr transformed uh, downtown Fort Worth. How was downtown Fort Worth before Sundance Square and Bass Hall? It was a completely different. It's transformed the way in which you live in the city. 
the Dallas Center for Performing Arts in Dallas is the, doing the same thing there. So we were an investor in Dallas Center for So you get involved in those transforming things. There's a Trinity project here in uh, Fort Worth. It's a very important but what will transform the quality of life in Fort Worth more than using our river, really, really using the river, not just having uh, a canal. The same in Dallas. We're involved in the, the Trinity project. So we get involved in those transforming type things. Now, since we're small and we can't write the size of checks that others can, how do we leverage that? We get in early. If you're an early adopter, then the price of entry is a whole lot liar, lower than the price of entry later on, just like the entrepreneurial world. If you're the VC guy, it costs less than, than the guy later on. And so you get to leverage your, you get more name recognition, et cetera. So it's as quickly as on the Dallas Center Performing Arts, we were one of the first companies to become involved in that. So because of our involvement early, we were able to be the name sponsor for the, um, the groundbreaking and the the celebratory uh, function around the groundbreaking. What was the celebratory function? Elton John concert. So we had, um, for a moderate investment, Julie Andrews walk out on the stage and say, well, like, in front of all of Dallas, I'd like to thank uh, Jeff Morris and David Wiseman of Line USA for sponsoring this event this evening. That's really good brands recognition. Uh, in the Trinity Project, uh, we were early, we were one of the first investors uh, in that project, and it's well recognized. We were, um, when Laura Miller was uh, plan trying to kill the project, and she was asking for a study to determine whether this was a viable project or not, she didn't want to send public money on it, she wanted, so I want to have this $50,000 consultant study to see if we want to proceed with this $2 billion project, and we're not going to pay for it. We went down, we aligned USA, went down to City Hall, delivered a $25,000 check uh, to pay for that study. And we're still recognized today uh, as an innovator in that uh, investment because we wrote a $25,000 check. We got a lot more mileage out of that than bigger checks have written later. So that's uh, the philosophy that we've used on philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Let me open it to the audience. Questions? Yes. Jeff, two, two small questions, Global. Is it a false sense of security, economic security, that the, uh, the, the majority of the non-speaking English world mandates English as a second language? And if Texas were in the middle of the United States, what would you advise a very young entrepreneurial 15-year-old, what second language would you highly recommend that, that individual start learning? That's a, a, a difficult way. I tell you what, I advised my 15-year-old uh, a few years ago, and they thought I was nutty. I, I advised them to take Latin. Why Latin? Because it's the base for six or seven languages. If you have a, a Latin base, then you have the ability to, to, that doesn't help you much with the Germanic languages. It doesn't help you much with the Asian languages. So that was the advice I gave a few years ago. Uh, Today, you know, you have core languages in the East, core languages in the, uh, the West. I, I, let me leave it this way. I do believe that the uh, economic center of gravity of the world is gradually moving from the Atlantic Basin to the Pacific Basin. That's, I think it's apparent. The demand growth rate of, the, of Europe and the United States combined over the next couple of decades is projected to be flat. Which makes sense. Demand growth rate in the Pacific Basin is projected to be plus five, six, seven, eight percent. So uh, I think the uh, focusing towards the Pacific Basin, uh, my son who took Latin, by the way, in high school ended up in Japan. Latin didn't help him a lot in Japan, but he <laughs> learned a little bit of Japanese while he was there. Can you off. But, you know. <laughs> Uh, so that's, I don't want to, 15 year olds, I will tell you, generally are a lot smarter than we give them credit for, a lot smarter than we are on these matters many times, so I tend to listen to them too, but uh, from a macro perspective, I think the trend lines are, are going uh, to the Pacific Basin. Right. Yeah. <coughs> Frank, the abundance of natural gas, can you give us your company's view on the difference between clean diesel and 
burn of natural gas and whether or not you see natural gas as a viable contender for the industry as a means of fuel? You accuse me of having a bias, but I try to stick with the science. The science shows that for heavy duty vehicle, that diesel is better than natural gas. That's the science. Uh, there's a study from Oregon National Labs, which I can give you the website. I think this is the most appropriate study because the study does, it does it on a well to wheels basis. So we take the uh, fuel efficiency, the emissions for the entire system. So for natural gas, it'll be the, the drilling rig, the pipeline, the gas recovery plant, the vehicle, all that. For a, for a diesel vehicle, it'll be the oil well, the pipelines, the refinery, the distribution center, the, the vehicle itself. And this study is very, very good because it did uh, all types of systems. It did hydrogen and, and hybrids and everything. Specific to diesel and, and natural gas. In the transportation sector, uh, using gasoline as a reference point, diesel, on a, the other thing they did is did it on a per mile basis. You see a lot of data on per gallon. Well, we don't drive gallons, we drive miles. So I'd like to look at the data well to wheels per mile. On a well to wheels per mile basis, uh, natural gas is 6% more fuel efficient than gasoline. Diesel is 20% more fuel efficient than gasoline. So if you have a vehicle that's working on diesel, why would you want to convert it back to natural gas to a lower fuel efficiency vehicle? Now on emissions, both natural gas and diesel are 20% better than, than gasoline. So they're equivalent on emissions. So uh, if a vehicle is gasoline, then I see no reason not to convert it to natural gas. It's pretty, that's pretty easy because you don't have to change the engine to put CNG into it. So you can have a more fuel efficient vehicle by just changing the tank and running the same engine. I don't see the, uh, the technical logic in moving from diesel to natural gas. Uh, there is one technology that we use today that does not make scientific sense that is growing and that happens periodically and that's ethanol. So I can't assure you that non-scientific solutions won't be subsidized and forced into the, the sector, but I believe they won't be sustained. So it's a long-term sustainable. So what is the, uh, the real value, I believe, of natural gas that today is um, it is a major transition fuel for the utility sector. 40% of the energy we use in the United States is in the utility sector, 40% is in the transportation sector. There's a vast need for natural gas in the utility sector as a transition from here to nuclear. Nuclear is, is the real answer for us. If we're serious about, as a world, having 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions without affecting our quality of life, there's only one technology that can do that, and that's nuclear. And uh, so I, I'm a, big, a very strong proponent of nuclear, but it's gonna take us 25, 30 years to get that done. We need something in the interim. Natural gas in the utility sector is the, that's the preferred use, the highest valued use of natural gas, and there's gonna be plenty of demand for it, is, is for that transition fuel in the utility sector to move from where we are today to the, a nuclear future. But I don't think it has a significant role in the transportation sector. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is the future of biodiesel? <coughs> I, I think it's good. I'm a big advocate of biodiesel. But I'm only an advocate of, of really one plant. If we're going to grow uh, fuels. There's only one plant uh, in the world that I've found so far that has a high enough growth rate, that's productive enough, that has the possibility uh, to economically compete with petroleum, and that plant is algae. Uh, if you compar compare on a per acre basis the growth rate, productivity rate of corn versus algae. Algae is about a thousand times uh, faster. So on, a, on an acre, a, that plant will grow that much faster. So we have that uh, ability. So it's, I, have, I have no confidence in corn. I have no confidence in cellulosic and all these other kinds of things that just are not scientifically productive enough uh, that even with the, with the most clever scientists that we can ever get them economically to compete with uh, a petroleum. Uh, but algae has the potential. 
Exxon themselves, smart company, investing $600 million in algae biodiesel. Now, I also like uh, causing the, the plant to make diesel rather than, than gasoline because diesel is lower carbon, diesel is 20% more fuel efficient, diesel has 20% lower emissions, so if you're going to, to make a molecule, why not make the, the diesel molecule? Uh, we have the fleet to, to, to use it. The other nice thing about biodiesel, it can be moved in the transportation sector we have today. Today we can't move ethanol in the pipelines that we have because ethanol eats up the seals and the pumps and the gaskets and the pipelines, et cetera. So we have to move the ethanol around the country in the trucks and trains. Uh, biodiesel, we can put straight in the same pipelines that we have today with uh, diesel fuel. Uh, ethanol vehicles have to be modified from gasoline vehicles. The gaskets have to be changed. The gasoline tank has to be changed. A few modifications to make an E85 vehicle out of a gasoline vehicle is not exactly the same. But uh, a biodiesel can be run in a diesel engine with no change. Just put it straight in. So it's fungible. Uh, we have a transportation system for it. We have a uh, plant that potentially can compete, need some investment, need, it's, it's still early. But if I were, and I, we, we as a company may do it, we're intrigued by it. We've been investigating algae biodiesel for a while. Uh, in fact, I sent my son to the first algae biodiesel conference uh, a few years ago in San Francisco. Uh, that would be the, uh, the fuel, I'd be, the plant I would be investing in because it, that plant is much, much more productive than any other uh, plant we can grow. Yes? Uh -huh. Our, our measurement's been uh, qualitative, not quantitative. Um, Bob Hopkins is here. I don't know where Bob is. Right, he's right behind you there. Bob's uh, watched us in Dallas. Uh, was an early. He can give you his his view. I'll tell you, give him my qualitative uh, assessment. Uh, Ten years ago, I would go to a, a chamber of commerce or a, a an event in Dallas. You know, event like this. I'd go to the, the Cox School and goes and they'd say, they'd say well, who you know, I'm Jeff Morris, I'm from Alon's. Well, what, what does Alon do? You know, can you tell me about it? And I'd tell them about our company, say, oh, we bought Fina. Oh, I have heard of Fina things. We, we, I have to introduce myself. Today, when I go to the, the Cox School of Business, I don't, that doesn't happen. Uh, sometimes, uh, People may not recognize, but I'll say, you know, I'll say, well, I'm Jeff Morris. Oh, yeah, you're that Elon guy. I say, yeah, I'm the Elon guy. So, oh, yeah, 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 I heard about you on the Trinity thing or this thing or the other thing. Uh, Ten years ago, if I called the mayor's office, you know, he would give me uh, assistant so and so and so and so, and I might get through. Today, you know, I, I go straight through. Sure. Uh, because it's not because of the business we, we only have we're in Dallas we're 120 jobs we're not the biggest employer by long shot in Dallas we're a relatively small company but we have uh, influence we have brand value today that we didn't have and so it's um, you'd have to test it but I think the uh, qualitative data is clear that our brand is substantially more valuable in Dallas today than it was 10 years ago and I would argue that we for a company our size, we may have one of the most valuable brands. Now this is, let me make clear about this, this is a, a public, uh, a corporate image kind of brand. And this is not a brand that's going to sell more stuff at the, the store necessarily. Now, and the reason that affects us is because our brand on our store is different, in our, in our stores are not in Dallas, they're in El Paso, so do we have an effect on El Paso? Probably not. I will change this is Stacy's done plenty of research to support this. If you have a brand that is a a retail brand that there's been more than enough studies that have done this show that if you have a product of equal value of equal quality equal price that you'll have a, a competitive advantage based upon the way people feel about your company so there is uh, the, a value in 
the how people feel about the company, their corporate image, uh, and I believe it's been uh, well worth the investment. And there is no real reason to go to the Cox School. <laughs> <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> you mentioned going against the trend in uh, some of your company decisions. How do you win that argument inside your own organization as well as a publicly traded company with shareholders and maybe Well, you don't, it's, you don't win the argument. It's not an argument. It's uh, a culture of the company. If the culture of the company is not consistent with the, the view is not, you, you, I can, you want to be against a thousand for a little while and you'll be a little bit successful, but you're not going to be, it's not, so it's the way we are. David Wiseman is uh, a big investor in education in uh, Israel. He's been a believer in the arts uh, in Israel. And to the, uh, let's just talk about the, the arts as, a, as an example, the Dallas Center Performing Arts, why we got involved there, back to, to leverage. Uh, for the amount of money that we spent uh, getting sponsorship at the Elton John concert, I might have gotten uh, one suite at American Airlines Stadium and one little uh, thing on that thing goes around the building, you know, fast, really fast. I wouldn't have gotten near the, the value because uh, arts are not as invested as much as I'd like to see. I believe that the arts are as more, much a part of a integral community as athletics. Athletics are important. Jobs are important, commerce are important, but you can't be a whole community without the arts. You, Fort Worth would not be the community it is without Bass Hall, without the Kimball. It, it, you would not be a whole community. So it's in. So David uh, invests in the arts in Israel. He turns over his lobby of his uh, office building to new startup artists every quarter. So he brings in a new artist. They bring in their pictures or their, their sculptures or whatever they are. You get to display him in the lobby of the, the building, and at the end of the quarter, he brings his uh, colleagues in, has a reception, and, and lets the uh, artist sell some of the art to that individual. So it, it's part of the culture of the company. So you need to, uh, either you as a leader have to adapt the culture of the company to your culture, or you need to join a company that has, do I have an effect on the culture of the company? you damn right, I have an effect. Uh, I think it's naive for us to uh, believe as leaders we don't. One thing I learned way back when, when I first became refinery manager at Big Spring is that the, or an organization, the Neely School, uh, Alon USA, uh, ExxonMobil, Goldman Sachs, you name it, for good or bad, uh, takes on the personality of the leadership. That is a heavy, heavy, heavy Management teaches that. We know that. that's a heavy, heavy, heavy responsibility, for good or bad. If I have bad habits and I have bad attributes, which I do, uh, the organization will emulate those. And if I have strengths and as a view and culture over the years, the, the organization will emulate those. It's a, it happens, and so that's why um, you can you see. The culture of organizations, you only have to look one place, and that's the, you see a, a restaurant where the service is poor, you only have to look one place, and that's to the management, not to the, not to the waiter or waitress. And uh, so it's, it's not an argument. It's a matter of a culture that's uh, developed, and so we all have to believe in it to, together. Now, then we have to go present it, sell it to the investment community. The investment community, if you, if you uh, have a thoughtful well, position, even if it's contrarian, will listen. There's a very many very creative uh, people on Wall Street, very many creative people here in uh, Fort Worth, venture capitalists that are open-minded. So that's not the issue. If it's, if it's thoughtful, it can't be just some crazy idea, but if you have a thoughtful analysis and even if it's contrarian and you're deciding as a refiner you're going to uh, have hybrid pickup trucks in your refinery, which seems idiotic. I'll give you one other thing quickly, I'll get you out of here. Uh, Stacy kids me about this, uh, my next car. I, I put it, I ordered it uh, more than a year ago from uh, through Corey Churchill here, Frank Kidd in uh, Fort Worth. I'll give you the website if you want to, to write it down. It's called Fisker Automotive, F-I-S-K-E-R automotive.com. What is a Fisker? Think about 
a Maserati plug-in hybrid. That's what a Fisker is. So a year from now, hopefully, I will be driving a 400 horsepower, 125 mile per hour, uh, five seconds, zero to 60, convertible plug-in hybrid. <laughs> this is a new idea, but I think it's the coming, I, why I believe in plug-in hybrids over electric vehicles, because I have an onboard generator. So I don't have to, the range of this vehicle is 40 miles on the batteries alone. If I'm at a battery grade, if I'm not, at least I can get home, you know, because I have an onboard generator. And I get 100 mile per gallon with the onboard generator. I can, I can bet, pretty much, I may be the only oil man in Dallas that's going to be driving a plug-in hybrid. <laughs> you have to drive a little bit slower on I-35. Well, I-35 <laughs> is slow to begin with. <laughs> Jeff, we want to thank you very much. Uh, we learned a lot about a lot in the industry and, and your management leadership style. Thank, thank you, you very much for doing this. And uh, we have a small gift for you. Thank and you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Again, I want to thank everyone for coming. And the, our next breakfast series is November the 17th at Barry Salzburg from Deloitte will be our guest. So thank you again and have a great day. Thank you.